but yet even so he is reckoning us just and our sins someday are going to work for our good because of justification it, I, I think it's a good thing to point out how r radical this is what you are doing is right I'm talking in the absolute sense looking from God's eyes because of Christ and because you have been reckoned with his death and he has taken the old humanity to the grave what you do is right even your failings are right justification that's what it is to proclaim right it's a right thing but you don't know what I did yesterday how can you say that was right because God with his divine alchemy and because of the cross he is going to turn that into a blessing somehow don't ask me how he's going to do it but we have a picture of it in Genesis chapter 50 with the story of Joseph when his brother sold him into slavery and they were all nervous after you know Joseph got real high and uh, powerful in Egypt and they came trembling and they were afraid he was going to kill them and he said this to them in chapter 50 you meant it for evil but God meant it for good you're listening to AM 1000 WCCD radio programming for the soul of the city it's time now for summer nights right here on WCCD for the next two hours, we will take you inside of the heart of ministries and churches that are making an impact on the city of Cleveland. And now, with this week's featured ministry, here is the host of Summer Nights, right here on AM 1000, Ricardo Johnson. Thank you, Eric, and welcome to this Friday edition of Summer Nights on WCCD. It is the soul of the city. Glad to have you listening in. Getting ready for the weekend, a hot weekend it looks like coming up here, and we hope that you'll have a lot of plans this weekend and enjoy yourself. But for tonight, we have Grace Cafe here. So let's go right now to Grace Cafe and let's go to Kurt. With no further ado, I want to start the introductions, and I have across the table from me the one and only Denise Tellup. Oh, I, I get to go Hi, Denise. first. Hey, <laughs> Good evening. If you're with us again tonight, we are excited. That means you want to know more. And you didn't get all your questions answered last night. And that's what we intend and, and prayerfully will accomplish tonight. Because we want your joy to be complete. <laughs> but When's you the know, pizza coming? <laughs> you know the lineup. We do have some Bible teachers here. We are a serious Bible study. We dig you into the know Greek. It. <laughs> yeah. sure. We have our moments of seriousness. But, and we do take on the tough topics. We take on most of the stuff that most pastors, teachers, preachers don't even want to touch. That's true. And um, we're not afraid. We dig into the scriptures in the Greek and the Hebrew. We have every version here on the table, lexicons, concordances, you name it. And it is our intention to rightly divide the word of truth with a pattern of sound words. And we are sticklers for words in context, knowing who's speaking, knowing who is being spoken to. So that's our hallmark. And to carry on in that vein, we have the one, the only, you know him, you love him, you can't live without him. That's questionable. <laughs> Martin Zender. Hi, thank you. Oh, oh we got a real explosion. Oh, no. <laughs> you wise guy. Thanks, Ricardo. <laughs> He found the explosion. That was good. He used to be introdu I'm introduced with pop cans, and now it's bombs. I'm honored. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> is he saying that you're bombing? <laughs> TGIF is all I can say. Thank you, and uh, welcome to Grace Cafe. Uh, Ken Primore is a, another Bible student at this table. Yay! No explosions, yeah. though. See, you only get applause. I get the explosions. Okay, yeah. It's good to be with you guys tonight and those out there listening. And it's just great to be in the scriptures. And hopefully we can bring something to you tonight. I hope that no one uh, uh, listening to us thinks that our message is somehow uh, complicated. I know we bring out a lot of, of scriptures, but our task is to uncomplicate things. Things are already complicated, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's complicated to uncomplicate the complications. <laughs> I mean, well, do you want... That's complicated. I'm telling that's complicated. <laughs> and whatever you say, don't tell us our message is confusing. Please, I'll give you confusing. Confusing is your church 
quoting, or your pastor quoting Romans 4, 6, saying, happy the man to whom God is reckoning righteousness apart from acts. And you get all excited about that. I'm reckoned righteous apart from acts. And you get all excited, but then you get quoted a passage like 1 John 1, 9 that says, oh, wait a minute, don't jump around too much. If you should be avowing your sins, which is an act, he is faithful and just that he may be pardoning you your sins. That is confusion. It can't be both ways. In other words, Christ took away your sins. You're saved by grace. Nothing you can do. But then to say, unless you act now, which is to avow, you won't have your sins forgiven. That's confusion. And it's this very thing that we're trying to undo. Okay? Now, are we saying that you don't have to do anything? Well, yes. You don't have to do anything to be saved. And yet, I want to make sure there's no misunderstanding, we still exhort one another to good acts to treat one another well. Ephesians 4, verse 1, walk worthily of the calling. Of course, we exhort each other to do that. But it's not in order to save ourselves or to be saved or to earn God's favor. It's a matter of our walk with fellow believers. You see the big difference. There's a big difference between exhorting one to walk worthily of the calling, a big difference between that and if you don't avow your sins, you will not be forgiven. We're not saying that. That's not our message. And the reason this confusion, I hope, is being cleared up for you is because we are telling you that 1 John 1, 9, that you must avow your sins in order to be forgiven, and Romans 4, that says God is reckoning righteousness to a person apart from acts, these two statements are coming from two completely different gospels and we know that is a shock to a lot of people that there are two good newses in the bible that are distinct from one another there's actually more than two good newses in the bible well actually uh actually yeah. timothy brought an evangel to paul concerning one of the churches he brought an evangel so really it's a generic word in the scriptures it simply means well message that's the literal elements in the Greek. Well, message. But concerning salvation, there are two main Gospels. And as we pointed out to you yesterday, it's the Gospel of the circumcision and the Gospel of the uncircumcision. You can read that in your King James Version. That where you talked about in Ephesians, the walk worthily of your calling. That walking worthily is an after-the-fact thing. It is something that is done by the Spirit, is that it is a fruit of the Spirit, it is a fruit of you knowing and coming into a realization of the salvation that was secured for you yeah. by Christ on the cross. It, it's fruit, which means it comes after, after the tree. Fruit doesn't precede the tree. The tree is first, the foundation is Christ, and the fruit comes after it. How wrong to say that um, we have to do these things or else not be saved. I hope nobody is pulling any works of the law into Ephesians 4 that says, unless you walk worthily, you're damned. I hope, but I think there are a lot of church, churches that are putting that message out. I know of people right off the top of my head, I can think of it, have called me and said, my church teaches that I can lose my salvation. That's, that's... Outrageous. Now, now, most Bible-believing people know that that is totally off the, off the rocker, yet a so-called ordained preacher, pastor, is teaching that message because they latch on to those verses, those very circumcision verses, and they say, look, look, how many of us all know that all den most denominations out there and fracturings of, of the body of Christ are a result of individual churches and bodies of believers camping out on one or two scriptures not knowing that, that, that this key exists. They do not know that the key that settles all controversy... Is that there's two it, Gospels. It's two it's Gospels. The key. That's the key. It's Galatians 2.7. This should make everybody jump up off of their seats and go, I get it. I see it. There's two evangels operating, one for the circumcision, 
One for the uncircumcision. This is exciting news. When you keep them separate, things work in the scripture. Man. When you put them together, try to make them fit, there's nothing but confusion. Mm -hmm. There is one other key that needs to be brought out, but you're going to have to come back when we come back in a, a week, and then you're going to get that key. But we're not going to give it to you tonight. I can't wait to find but out what it is. But there's another key that we will <laughs> explain to you that will help. <laughs> So we do exhort one another. And, uh, you know, John, Peter, Jude, um, James, the book of Hebrews are all dealing with conditional pardon, a conditional pardon. It did depend on uh, your avowal, whether you were pardoned or not. It very well, it did depend, not denying that. My big, I don't have any problems with that. I have a problem with people dragging conditions into Paul's gospel of unadulterated grace. That is what set the apostle, uh, made him crazy concerning the Galatians. They were dragging conditions into his pure evangel, and it's a mixed gospel. The circumcision Evangel. It's a Jewish gospel, a vowel, and the baptism for entrance into the thousand-year kingdom. Paul to the nations presented a gospel apart from Jewish connections, apart from law, apart from any fleshly advantage. In fact, Paul presented people justified in Christ. And even though we point all these distinctions out, it's an amazing thing, people still will say, I don't care what scriptural facts you present concerning different Gospels. I'll parrot the Orthodox line. I don't care what scriptural facts you present concerning different Gospels. I'll parrot the Orthodox line. Yes, it's hard to believe it, but that happens occasionally. <sighs> we know that... Uh... Mike, where are you? <laughs> where did that bird come from? <laughs> That's a parrot. Yes, I he know it's a parrot. The Orthodox <laughs> line, he doesn't care about the facts. Thank we, you, Mayanna. Now, so, so much of what we talk about, you really have to be following along in your scriptures. Um, if you look away, go to the bathroom, you could miss one or two scriptures that we have given you that actually show that we're telling the Do truth. Do not go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and in the, I, I even am aware of people that got upset and uh, it, you know Why? We're, we're discuss because they're not used to this they haven't heard it before and uh, it it doesn't make any difference to them that we stay in the scriptures one hundred percent of the time. Well, it's just what the parrot said. I know it. Well, he I doesn't care it. that we're in the scriptures and we bring scripture after scripture. Right, and that's we're our gonna, hallmark. We're going like to keep on doing it. That's the only reason why we are bold. <clears throat> that is the only reason why we can sit at this table in the middle of an Orthodox Christian camp and take each doctrine one at a time and say, look, somebody messed with this. Oh, here's another one. Look, somebody messed with this. It's not that we know everything. God has called us to this. We know that. We are heralding the word for the body of Christ to take away the confusion and to return joy. One thing that we want to know is that, uh, or want you to know, is that God is blessing you with the truth. If you're sitting at your, at your table tonight and you're listening, he is blessing you. I, love, I want to thank so many of the people that called last night on our, on our 440-230-2000 line and called today and blessed us with the idea that you were getting it. Oh, it was so exciting. Uh, some of you callers that said, we see it, we see it, we see it. Uh, and you said, oh, man, one man called in and said, finally, somebody knows what I have seen. Well, we know you're out there and we know that you probably... Um, you feel a little bit alone in your voice because the mass, the mass of Christianity in the religious co uh, community of Christianity cannot or has not seen this, and they want to punch you down because you do. Um, hang on. There's a bunch of us out here. I'd like to ask, um, are you pardoned or are you justified? Are you forgiven? Or are you justified? Now don't say both. Because you can't be both. It is manifestly impossible to be both forgiven and justified. It's impossible. I'm going to tell you why. In the Greek, forgiveness means from let 
That's the literal elements in the Greek. The Greek word is aphesis, but you don't need to know Greek to understand this, as you're about to see. To let off, from let, to let you from, let you off the hook. With forgiveness, we're saying this, you did wrong, but we're going to overlook it on the basis of mercy or whatever, and we're going to let you off from let, aphesis, we're going to let you off the hook. Forgiveness assumes guilt. You have to be guilty in order to be forgiven. I, I trust that most, uh, if not all, of our listeners will understand that. There's no such thing as for, forgiving an innocent person. Forgiveness assumes guilt. Justification, on the other hand, comes from the root word just, obviously, which means right. What you did was right. You did no wrong. You are not guilty. Okay, this guy's, this guy's not guilty, so let's decide whether we should pardon him or not. Hmm. Doesn't make sense. It does not make sense, because I'll say it again, it's very critical to understand this. Forgiveness assumes guilt. There's no such thing as forgiving an innocent or a righteous person. Justification is, it's not like what the church tells you. It is just as if I've never sinned. No, it says righteous. There's no sin. There's no wrong. It's not just as if I've never sinned. It's no sin. It's right. That's the root word. It's right. I'll give you a practical example. Richard Nixon. There wasn't a court in the land that would justify Richard Nixon. He wasn't justified. No one, no court found him innocent. He was guilty of wrongdoing. Has anyone ever heard that Nixon was justified? No, but what was he? Pardoned. pardoned. He was pardoned. A judge can either find guilt or acquit of guilt. A judge's job is to just say whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. A judge cannot pardon anybody. If Mike, I wish Mike was here. He's in the court system. He could tell us that. No judge ever pardoned anybody. The judge's job is to say guilty or not guilty. The executor is the one with the powers of pardon. Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. If Richard Nixon had been found justified, that means if the court had looked at the evidence and said, well, we've weighed the evidence, you didn't do it. You're not guilty. In the eyes of this court, you are not guilty. So Gerald Ford's going to go back and sit in his room. Oh, should I pardon him or shouldn't I? Should I pardon him or shouldn't I? You cannot be both pardoned and justified. A pardon as we have been saying, is conditional. It can be revoked. Oh yes, a pardon can be revoked. But if you're just, if you're not guilty of sin, not guilty, I'm not saying we don't sin. Am I saying that? No. I am saying that God now looks at us through a perfect sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice, His Son. And through His Son, He is now looking at us and saying, you are not guilty. I now reckon you righteous. We're reckoned righteous. In ourselves, no, because of him. Because now God is looking at us through him. That's in Paul's gospel. The circumcision evangel has not come that far. It is not that far reaching. It is not that deep. If we're still dealing with the flesh in the circumcision gospel. We're still dealing with are you an Israelite or not. Paul says it doesn't matter. We're all humans and we have all failed. And there's some critical differences here. And I'm going to take you through scriptures one at a time and show you that uh, pardon and forgiveness is consistent with the kingdom proclamation. It's all through the Gospels. It's all through Acts. Funny thing, you never read of justification in the circumcision gospel. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you never read of being justified before God, the kind of justification Paul talks about. Paul exclusively speaks of a justification that pronounces you right, 
righteous in the sight of God. And from that, you need no pardon. And I'm not just going to have you take my word for it. I got a list of scriptures. And when we come back from the break, we're going to go through them one by one. And I want you to, I do want you to have your Bible out. This, that's not just a, a cliche. We really do want you to bring out your Bible. And don't put any cream in your coffee. Drink it black. That's the only way to drink coffee. That's the way I drink it. Anyway. Charlie, I know, he's always trying to get me to put cream in mine. I won't do it. He did the other night. Oh, you weren't supposed to say that. Well, you can imagine how much fun you're going to have in about three minutes. Because... Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 what are you trying to do Not to me, Not as much Ricardo? fun as that. <laughs> we'll be back with more. Grace. <laughs> you made Catholic. me nervous there for a second. And, and you've been pardoned from that. <laughs> But not justified. <laughs> There's the explosion. <laughs> Just play with you guys. Just, just, just see if you guys are awake over there because you know you're going around and around and talking. And I don't know if you're awake. I have to wake you up. We'll be back in about three minutes <laughs> at summer nights here on WCCD. Stick around. Welcome back to the Wild and Crazy Gang here at Summer Nights Grace Cafe. <laughs> Glad to have you listening in. Get your Bible, your concordance, and whatever else you study the Word of God, Word Studies, and check it out with us. The number to call at the top of the hour is one 281 1110 That's one 281 1110 well, you're getting your thoughts together. You had mentioned... Uh, How do you know they're not together? <laughs> well, I can see that. <laughs> I have eyes. <laughs> you had mentioned uh, something about being reckoned righteous, and I just want to read a scripture that goes along with that real quick, and that would be Romans 5.19. For even as though through the disobedience of one man the many were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one the many shall be constituted just. And that constituted there is an active verb form, meaning that we are being constituted just at every point. And uh, then that goes right into 520 that we probably uh, wore out with, uh, you know, where sin increases and grace super exceeds. See, it's all formed in the grace that we're being constituted just by. That's the very root and the element of justification, the payment of Christ on the cross and the grace of God. The way I, yeah, the way I understand it, I don't know, maybe this is a simple way to put it. Far be it for me to say anything simple, but um, we're reckoned just, but someday we'll be constituted just. Is that falling in line with what you, you're, you're saying we're being constituted just? Right. I guess I had a different thought about it. I mean, that we're, we're, it's reckoned to us now ahead of time, like the God who calls what is not as if it were. Right. Like Abraham. Right. And he's reckon it, reckoning it to our account. But as far as being constituted, made just, I mean, because we still sin. But yet, even so, he is reckoning us just. And our sins someday are going to work for our good because of justification. It, I, I think it's a good thing to point out how r radical this is. What you are doing is right. I'm talking in the absolute sense, looking from God's eyes, because of Christ, and because you have been reckoned with His death, and He has taken the old humanity to the grave. What you do is right. Even your failings are right. Justification, that's what it is, to proclaim right. It's a right thing. But you don't know what I did yesterday. How can you say that was right? Because God, with His divine alchemy, and because of the cross, He is going to turn that into a blessing somehow. Don't ask me how He's going to do it. But we have a picture of it in Genesis chapter 50 with the story of Joseph when his brother sold him into slavery. And they were all nervous after you know Joseph got real high and uh, powerful in Egypt. And they came trembling and they were afraid he was going to kill them. And he said this to them in chapter 50. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. All those evil things the brothers did, selling, uh, throwing him into the pit, lying to their, to their, uh, their father about, about Joseph, 
All the things, all the evil was right in God's sight. How can the same action be wrong and right at the same time? It depends on the viewpoint. No man would ever say that what those brothers did was right, but God, uh, but Joseph understands that God meant all of that for good. So in God's sight, it was right. The crucifixion is another great example. It was justified. The crucifixion of Christ was justified. Do you realize what I'm saying? I'm saying that it was right. It was right. Oh, you're, you're not telling me that it was right for those guys to kill Christ, to, to beat Him, to mock Him. That wasn't right. Not in man's eyes, but I say it again, in God's eyes, it was right. It was right because of what it produced. What does it produce? That's what justification is. Is that radical? And some, that's why we can relax and rest in Christ. And we still exhort one another to, to do the right thing. But we know that even our failings in God's sight are now reckoned right. What you did was right. But you know, what you did was right in God's sight. Absolutely speaking, looking through the cross. That's, I'm sorry, but that is what justification is. And it's my job Don't to tell sorry. you how radical it is. No, no I, I shouldn't apologize. That is the I take truth. back, I, <laughs> Ricardo's hip. It's I'm, an explosion because, yeah, what you did was right. That is, rad, that, I'm sorry, but that is how radical justification is. Thank you for that explosion. That was very appropriate. At I that can time. understand a little, uh, understand it in a very limited sense. Because of the fact that as we were constituted sinners, before we ever did anything. Good. Okay. That's good. Before we ever acted out a sin. Okay. And that was through the disobedience of one. That's also through the obedience of the, of the, uh, of the one. The many shall be constituted just. I understand it in a limited sense because I see that we, as God is using sin for us to come to a revelation of Him. Right. I see how it can be right. And no matter what you do, when you're in Adam, Adam took the whole race down into sin without us even sinning yet. He just did it and we're constituted sinners because of Him. All of our righteousness... Can all of our righteousness get it? Can any of our righteousness get us out of Adam? Anybody? No way. No. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. Now, you say, well, that's not fair. I didn't sin like Adam did. How come I'm constituted a sinner? Well, wait a minute. You better turn that coin over real quick. Because, because of Jesus Christ's work, none of your sins can get you out of that. You see? Just as none of your righteousness could extract you out of Adam, with this evangel of grace, none of your sins can extract you from Christ because it was all done before you were born. And that's how, because Christ took all humanity to the grave, and we're going to go there. We're not talking out of the air. It's in Romans chapter 6. We're going to get there. You will see that uh, the old humanity was crucified. All of your failings were already crucified. That's why you can now live in newness of life in spite of what you see. I know some of you, and I'm talking from experience, you're looking in your mirror and you say, I'm justified? Oh my God, you've got to be kidding. Me, justified? Lord, you don't know me. But you know, that's why Paul says we are to walk by faith not perception. Because if you walk by perception, you're going to stumble at your flesh. You're going to see yourself and you're going to recognize that I'm a worthless sinner. And yeah, we've already, we already know that. That's why Christ died. Now, because He took you down to the grave with Him, you can now live in newness of life in spite of your failings. We're going to get into that. Boy, that's so... That's a... That, that's that, a treasure trove. That just makes me think I see a little bit of a contradiction there. Because of Paul saying, walk by faith, not by sight. But yet we had a verse out of James. And it said, show me. Show me. Show me your show works. Me right. Another your works. Mm -hmm. and, I will, uh, and I will be showing you. It's perception there. Right. And that is part of the circumcision gospel. 
That's right. Paul says, don't walk by perception, walk by faith. And faith is, you have, you are to reckon yourself righteous. You are to reckon yourself yeah. righteous because God does. We couldn't dare do that unless God told us that that's the way it is. And that's why Romans is so hard for people to grasp because it doesn't mesh with their observation. People are walking by observation. They're down, you're down on yourself because you failed again. You tried to walk worthily and you failed again, didn't you? You failed today, you failed this morning, and you know you're going to fail tomorrow. And that is going to keep bringing you down. You are freed from having to worry about your flesh. Did you know that freedom from sin does, has, has nothing to do with how much or how little you sin? Freedom from sin, that's right. It has nothing to do with how much or how little you sin. Freedom from sin means that you are now free from worrying about your sins, from fretting, from being condemned. Right. You are free now to worship God. You are free to lift your hands in praise in spite of what your body is doing. And you know, this is going to have power. You think, if I do that, my flesh is going to go nuts. You know, it's just the opposite of what you think. Because we showed you with a Mosaic law, that's what makes flesh go nuts. When you put laws on yourself, and when you try and get those New Year's resolutions, and you swear you'll never, you'll never touch another glass of alcohol, or you're, or you're, 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 you'll never cheat on your wife again. That inflames the flesh. That law, those laws make things worse. You know that. You know it. It's that way. And we've been hammering it over and over again. Romans 5.20. That's what will happen. Law came so that the offense would increase. Turn from strivings in the flesh and in spite of your sin, dare to walk by faith, not perception. God today is reckoning you righteous because of Christ. Why do you think He died? He died for that. If you're still feeling guilty, it's a slap in the face. Why do you think He was slapped? Why do you think He was spit upon and beaten and stripped of His clothing and hung on the cross? Because of your sins. So now, why are you repudiating the grace of God by feeling bad that you failed Christ? He wants you to live in newness of life. That's Romans chapter 6. Walk as if resurrected from among the dead. He's not talking about the day you are resurrected. Then you wouldn't have to walk as if resurrected. I'm in Romans 6. Walk as if today. Walk as if you're resurrected from among the dead. Believe. Have faith in Romans 8, 1. Nothing, nothing, consequently, is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Let's go to some verses showing pardon and forgiveness. And again, we're changing channels big time from what I just said because we're descending now from an evangel of grace into a circumcision evangel which has to do with conditional pardon. What I was just talking about for the last 10 minutes was justification. Now you really have to, I really have to jerk the rope here to pull you back into a different gospel. Because all the verses I'm going to read talk about pardon and forgiveness. And it's all in the circumcision gospel. Turn to Mark chapter 1 verse 4. I'm not going to comment very much. I just want you to see these verses. And I want you to see that pardon and forgiveness is consistent and inherent in the kingdom proclamation. John the Baptist came to be in the wilderness and is heralding a baptism of repentance for the pardon of sins. Okay, that, that's all I want to do there. Turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Gee, I didn't know there were 76 verses in Luke. That's a lot of verses. Luke 1, 76. This is Zechariah speaking of his son. Now you also, little boy, a prophet of the Most High shall be called, for you shall be going before in the sight of the Lord, to make ready His roads, to give the knowledge of salvation to His people Israel in the pardon of their sins because of the merciful compassions of our God. That word merciful also entails guilt. Yes, mercy. That's right, Charlie. Mercy presupposes guilt. 
with justification, God is not being merciful to us in that sense because we are right in His sight. Um, turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 3. And he came into the, and this is uh, John, he came into the entire country about the Jordan, heralding a baptism of repentance for the pardon of sins. We see this phrase over and over again with John the Baptist, repentance for the pardons, pardon of sins. And you know, Jesus is not going to do anything different when he comes. He's going to herald a pardon also. Uh, look, to, look at Luke now, chapter 24, verse 46. Then he opens up their mind. This is Jesus speaking to the gentleman on the road to Emmaus. He opens up their mind to understand the Scriptures and said to them that, quote, Thus it is written, and thus must the Christ be suffering and rise from among the dead the third day. And there is to be heralded in his name repentance for the pardon of sins. That's what I'm looking at there. Repentance for the pardon of sins. The same thing John the Baptist was preaching. Now turn to, you'll see this, a, a consistent, a consistency here throughout the early part of the New Testament. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. The day of Pentecost. Okay, we had John the Baptist proclaiming the coming king. Then we had the king himself. Didn't change the message there was still to be a heralding of pardon and repentance and now we have Peter speaking to the Sanhedrin I'm in Acts chapter 5 uh, verse 31 this inaugurator and and Savior God exalts to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and the pardon of sins why well they were guilty they were guilty as heck they for uh, they rejected Yahweh in the Old Testament. They rejected John. They rejected Christ in the flesh. And now they're uh, rejecting the testimony of the Spirit through Peter, James, and John. So they're guilty, guilty, guilty. What do they say? Guilty is sin, right? So they need a pardon of, of, of their sins. Let's go back a couple pages. I should have gone there. First, Acts 2.38. That's the big verse. We talked about that last night. Uh, this, this is uh, on the day of Pentecost. Peter is saying to them, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the pardon of your sins. There's personal merit involved here, just like in the book of James, because James is consistent with this call. There is personal merit. Agree with that. You do have to avow. You have to be baptized. You have to be. You have to repent and be baptized in order for those sins to be pardoned in that context. In that context. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's true in that context. You had to have the proper attitude. And see, this is another big difference. This goes along with what you were saying, Charlie, that uh, it's by sight. But with Paul, it, it's, it's by faith. And we looked at that last night. Uh, with 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 baptism, you could see that. Okay, that guy's being baptized. Well, there's a person who's 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 repenting. And James said, show me your works, and by that way I'll know you have faith. It's all sight. Paul says, again, um, we're to walk by faith, not perception. We should probably give that verse, I think it's 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 7, I think. Somebody want to check up? I don't want to give a wrong verse, so somebody... And you know what the scary thing about pardon is? And this is really scary. If you're, If you want to be under this uh, gospel of circumcision, I would not know why, especially when Paul is in the scriptures, when you have a great book like uh, Romans, but because a pardon can be revoked. If you, if you blow it, it can be revoked. And I think this is where people get the idea of you can lose your salvation. Because they're reading parables and they're, they're reading these things from Acts and they're reading things out of Hebrews and a pardon can be revoked. Uh, yes. And I think that's where people are getting that idea. And, and the people also should just look at chapter 2, verse 36 in, Acts, Acts, in the book of Acts and notice where it says, let all the house of Israel know certainly. So they need to keep in mind right. while they're reading it the context of... of that is, the pardon that's being brought out is to Israel. Yes. Pentecost, 
get ready with that explosion uh ricardo you got that explosion lined up i don't need it yet but you'll you'll know where where it's to go when i say this pentecost was not the beginning of the body of christ oh you weren't here mike we got real explosions <laughs> Pentecost was a continuance of the. You know, there it is. <laughs> Pentecost that's was a nuclear. A, yeah, explosion. that that's a nuke job. Pentecost was a continuing of the circumcision proclamation, coming down right from Abraham to John the Baptist through our Lord and through the twelve. It's not until Saul is called on the road to Damascus that we begin to see a new church called out a new body called the body of Christ you have to understand something that happens in Acts uh, chapter 3 verse 19 when Paul or when uh, Peter says remember this is after Pentecost this is after Jesus has died and resurrected and uh, or you know this he's in the middle of it I should say but this is after Jesus has already gone and been resurrected he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ. Isn't this startling? Think about this a second. Paul is, or Peter is standing there saying, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Verse 20 tells you that, look at his frame of mind. He is standing there saying, Jesus is going to turn right around and come back right now, right now. He had no clue about the pause. What was the, fir yeah. what was the first question they asked him in, in, the, in this book? Yeah, aren't thou now... Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they, when they, they came together and he was about to ascend, they said, Lord, art thou at this time restoring the kingdom to Israel? This should back up everything we've been saying this week, that the whole concern of these folks at this time was the kingdom to Israel. And he didn't rebuke him for asking that question. He didn't rebuke him for asking. He just said that not yours is to know the times. And if he had told them that there would be this 2,000-year interim uh, from the time of their preaching to the time of the inauguration of the kingdom, assuming it's uh, soon, uh, I think it would have taken the wind out of their uh, excitement that we see in on the day of Pentecost. So they, right, right, Denise, that for all they knew, um, as they were preaching the kingdom on the day of Pentecost, uh, it was ready. Near is the kingdom. And they weren't kidding. Near is the kingdom. If the nation of Israel had repented, Humanly speaking now, near is the kingdom. They weren't kidding. If the nation had repented at that time, the seasons of refreshing would have come. But just as Israel was at the door of the promised land, remember, they were right at the door. Near is the promised land. Because of unbelief, they had to wander 40 years in, in the wilderness. Likewise, this is a parallel experience for this nation Israel. They are right at the door of the kingdom. And because of unbelief, they are turned away. And the kingdom is put on hold. And Paul explains that secret in Romans chapter 11. That callousness has come upon Israel until the fullness of the nations may be entering. And that during this interval is when Paul unleashes from the heavens the fullness of God's grace. It's important to note, too, that it was God who hardened Israel. It was God. Yeah, Romans 11, 8. We'll be back in just a few minutes with more Grace Care. Do you remember last week when I was on Romans chapter 3 and I was telling you that Romans 3, 9, 10, and 11 is ironclad? That whole bit of not one seeking out God. I told you that Paul was putting everyone in an impossible situation, whether they've heard of Christ or not heard of Christ, whether they're a Jew or a Greek, he's putting everyone in an impossible situation, uh, situation so that he can unveil Christ. And he unveils Christ in 321 of Romans. And then I told you that 
there's a whole religion that claims to believe the Bible that doesn't um, believe that they are under that ironclad decree that no one is seeking out God because they think they seek out God even though it says no one seeks out God of course I told you they think they're the exception Christians I'm talking about they're different you see because one problem with this well there's many problems with that but when I turned off the camera on Friday I thought of another big problem with it you remember how emotional I got on uh, must have been Thursday, I think, when I got to the verse in Romans 3.21, after Paul has spent from chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20. It's a tough section of Scripture for Paul to write. And it's a tough section of Scripture for most people to read, unless you're a Christian. Then it doesn't bother you whatsoever, because you don't think it applies to you. But... And remember, I started that video, those two videos, because somebody had written me and said they get depressed when they read these sections of Romans, and they get they get um, depressed. Yeah. And that's good. That's part of it. Because it's the prelude to Romans three twenty one, and that's why I got so emotional about it because. Paul turns a corner and he begins to explain the solution and the solution is Christ. But here's the thing, unless you believe Romans 1.18 through 3.20, then that verse in 3.21, yet now apart from law, righteousness of God is manifested, a righteous not, a righteousness of God, of Jesus Christ's faith what's the big deal apart from law a righteousness of God is manifest a righteousness of God is manifest if you have your own righteousness why do you need the righteousness of God why would you lunge desperately for the righteousness of God if you don't die why would you need to be resurrected if you have a free will why do you pray for God's will if you have power if you're not helpless and if you have power which is the opposite of being helpless why would you look for God's power it's all sham it's all fake it's all words in a song words in a song it's all it is it's all it is Disgusting, actually. It's a right disgusting law. That, yeah. Because you've completely watered down the necessity for that by not understanding the ironclad lockdown of Romans 1, 18 through 320. Are you following me? I think you are. If you think it doesn't apply to you, if you think that your faith is all important, then you get to 321 and apart from law, righteousness of God is manifest. And there's another thing, apart from law. Why would anyone get excited about that if they're in the realm of law and they think they can do law? If you're honest with yourself, you're supposed to read Romans 1, 18 through 320 and just be leveled, desperate, aware of your helplessness. That's the God thing to do. That's the normal thing to do, unless you've been brainwashed into a cult and you think that doesn't apply to you. And then when you get to 321, you're like, oh my God. There's a rescue, and that's why I got emotional. I get choked up about it because I know that I'm helpless. That, that's a hell of a thing, the day you realize that. It's a hell of a thing. I'll never forget the day I realized that. I told you this. I was a Christian for three years, two or three. And then one day it hit me. Holy shit. 
it really is not of me. This Romans 1, 18 through 320 actually applies to me. I'm helpless. I'm going to eternal death apart from a rescuer. No difference between me and any other flesh out there. No difference. It's a hell of a revelation. Hell of a revelation. That's the beginning. That's saving faith. Until you get to that point, there's no saving faith in either evangel. Not in the circumcision and not in the uncircumcision. No, because even in the circumcision, Paul says uh, his desire for his people according to flesh is that they come to a is for their salvation but Paul says the problem is Romans 10 4 is that um, they're seeking to establish their own righteousness and doing that they're not subject to the righteousness of God what a day that is when you realize that that shit actually applies to you that's a day and then there's the topic of death this is the same thing really it's one of those things where when you realize what death is it should scare the crap out of you and it should be a terrible thing a nightmarish thing it's not a friend that takes you to be with God it's an enemy that takes you away from God it's an enemy no one praises God in death and so death is an enemy Paul calls it an enemy he says the last enemy is abolished death it's another thing it's not believed by Christians they don't believe it they take God's statements and they hijack them and they turn them into lies. They turn God's statements into lies. God didn't mean that. God really didn't mean that you're helpless. I mean, you do have a free will, but you know. God didn't mean that you die. No, no, that's, they fall for Satan's lie, that you don't die. Therefore, when you read about the resurrection, what's the big deal? That's my point, what's the big deal? You read that Christ is the resurrection and the life, and Christians just yawn at that. They don't give a shit about that verse. They can't. Because you don't need resurrection or life if you don't really die. So it's all... It's all just uh, neutral. None of it means anything. The bad stuff is modified. The death is modified because it doesn't really mean death. Everybody has an immortal soul. The helplessness is modified because no one's really helpless. Everybody has a free will. But when you do that, then you also modify the saving faith of Christ and the resurrection. You modify it. That is, you don't really believe it. So er everything is nullified. It's amazing how Satan does this. I mean, it really is astounding how Satan can pull this off. And... I guess it's not so amazing because all he has to do, he knows how to do it, he gets, it's human pride, it's pride. Pride doesn't want to believe in either helplessness or death. Those are the two largest humiliations and embarrassments to the human. Selfish, uh, hopelessness, helplessness, eh, same thing, and death. But until people come to a realization of what these things really are and that the scripture verses are actually true then there can be no lunging toward the solution lunging toward the answer I'm basically making a case for for desperation I'm making a case because the desperation, the guy who's starving to death or dying of thirst, nobody ever appreciated a cup of water more than a guy dying of thirst. Nobody ever appreciated a hamburger more than a guy starving to death. Nobody ever appreciated the end of a rope who wasn't, you know, stuck in a well. I mean... The answer means nothing unless you first realize the predicament you're in. So uh, it's just a real tragedy. I really don't know what they're all singing about then, really. I don't know what they're singing about. I think it's just, I mean, because if it's not, if it's not a great rescue, if it's not a, 
a solution to desperate people. What are they all singing about? I think maybe they just like to hear themselves sing. <laughs>